last lecture, we talked about the formation of dendrites and we covered pure materials. Okay, so there were no solutes involved in the solidification process. The only thing that limits uh, solidification is then the flow of heat. And I mentioned that if you have a negative temperature gradient in the liquid, that means if the liquid is supercooled ahead of the transformation interface, then any small perturbation in the interface will tend to become unstable and develop into dendrites. Okay, so if I, for whatever reason, I have a small perturbation in that interface, then it's actually advancing into supercooled liquid and therefore it will tend to grow even faster. And that's what we call an unstable interface. On the other hand, if we have a positive temperature gradient in the liquid, then any perturbation will tend to dissolve because it's advancing into hot liquid. So an interface like this would be stable, whereas an interface like this would be unstable when you have a negative temperature gradient in the liquid. Now, this kind of a scenario is actually quite rare where you get a negative temperature gradient in the liquid. And one example that I gave you was if there was a lot of latent heat of fusion evolving at the interface, then clearly we might have uh, a higher temperature at the interface than further away in the liquid. And yet, when we look at solidification, we see dendrites all over the place, even in impure materials and even when there is a positive temperature gradient in the liquid. So why do we get dendritic solidification even though we have a positive temperature gradient in the liquid? What is it that is causing the liquid ahead of the interface to be supercooled? That's what we are going to answer today and the particular supercooling that we'll discover is because of solute concentration gradients and that's why it's known as constitutional supercooling. Okay, so I'll explain how that arises in the next few slides. So the point I'm trying to make is that even when we have a positive temperature gradient in the liquid, there is something else which can cause the liquid ahead of the interface to be supercooled and give an unstable interface and dendritic solidification. And in today's lecture, then I will cover constitutional supercooling, talk about uh, both dendritic solidification and cellular solidification in alloys. So no longer considering pure materials. We'll then go into non-equilibrium solidification, so where we've lost the fact that the interface compositions are given by a tie line of the phase diagram. We'll look at the consequences of dendritic solidification because it causes bits of liquid which are rich in solute to be trapped between the dendrite arms and then we get an inhomogeneous material, and that has consequences. Uh, for example, leading to an anisotropic development of microstructure in the solid state when you heat treat the material. So we begin with constitutional supercooling. Uh, this is a, a familiar phase diagram to you now. This is the what we call the liquidus boundary, the boundary between the liquid and liquid plus solid phase fields. This is the solidus phase boundary, so between the solid and solid plus liquid phase field. And at this particular temperature, we are looking at steady state solidification because the equilibrium composition of the solid is the same as the composition of the alloy as a whole. Okay, so this particular tie line represents the point where the alloy has cooled to a, uh, a temperature where the composition of the solid given by the phase diagram is the same as your average alloy composition. Okay, so it's just from the last lecture. So we look at steady state solidification. And because these are, in the vast majority of cases, these are almost straight lines, okay? We can represent the slope of this straight line, which is the change in the liquidus temperature with the change in the chemical composition as a constant value m, okay? So the constant m is simply the slope of this liquidus phase boundary as a function of the chemical composition. So when I say the liquidus temperature, I mean the temperature at which freezing first begins on cooling. So 
here's that phase diagram again, and we're looking at steady state solidification, so the composition of the solid is exactly the same as that of the alloy, far away from the interface, or the far field composition. And of course, we have this gradient of solute ahead of the boundary, because in reaching this point of steady state solidification, we had to go through a variety of stages where the composition of the solid was less than C0, so we partitioned solute, and this is the remnant of that partitioned solute. So we've got a composition profile ahead of the interface. So the liquid over here is richer in solute than the liquid over here. Now, if the liquid here is richer in solute, then its freezing temperature will be different, right? You know, here we have a greater concentration of solute, and therefore the freezing temperature will be lower than at this point where the freezing temperature will be higher. Yeah. So if I plot the freezing temperature, the liquid acid temperature, it looks like this, corresponding to this variation of concentration. So the liquid doesn't have the same properties ahead of the interface. Its composition is changing, and therefore its freezing temperature is changing. And further away from the interface, because we have a lower solute concentration, the freezing temperature is higher. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Now this is the actual temperature gradient ahead of the interface. The liquid is hotter in general ahead of the interface because we are withdrawing heat from the mold. Yeah? So the heat flow is through the liquid, through the solid, and into the mold surface. So in the vast majority of cases, you will have a positive temperature gradient in the liquid. So this is the real temperature gradient, and this is the freezing temperature. And you can see that there is a region here where the liquid is actually below its freezing temperature. Okay. This region is the supercooled zone. So even though the temperature here is higher than here, okay, this region is actually below its freezing temperature because of the variation in solid concentration. So we've now got a supercool zone ahead of the solid liquid interface, even though this temperature gradient is positive. Okay. So in these circumstances, the solid liquid interface is again unstable. So just to summarize, we have a variation of concentration in front of the interface. That variation of concentration leads to a corresponding variation in the freezing temperature. Okay. And if your actual temperature gradient in the liquid is as illustrated, then there will be a zone ahead of the solid liquid interface which is below the freezing temperature, a supercooled zone and therefore we will get dendritic solidification even with a positive temperature gradient. And this is what we mean by constitutional supercooling. Is supercooling induced by changes in composition, changes in constitution. Okay. Now, if I make the temperature gradient in the liquid even steeper, okay, so if, I, if the temperature gradient is like this, then the supercooled zone will become narrow. Yeah? And there will come a point where the black line here has a gradient which is greater than the gradient of this red line, in which case there will be no supercooled zone and you will get a stable interface. So what, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to calculate this gradient here of the red line to define the condition at which constitutional supercooling disappears. Okay. So I need to know the variation in the freezing temperature as a function of distance, or, of course, the variation in the concentration as a function of distance, because the two are related by the slope m. Right? So we are going to derive that now. And I'm not introducing any new theory. We've already done this because you have an equation describing this variation. We did that in the last lecture, and I'm just going to revise that a little bit. All I need, actually, is I don't need the gradient at every point. I just need the gradient at this location, 
if the actual temperature gradient is steeper than the gradient here, then I have a stable interface. So you remember this equation here. This is the concentration gradient at x equals 0. And that must equal to the rate at which we are pushing solute ahead of the interface. Uh, I explained this in the last lecture. So we already have a clear relationship between the concentration gradient at the interface and the velocity and quantities from the phase diagram and the diffusion coefficient. Okay. So if I take that equation, what I need to do is convert it into a variation in the liquidus temperature. Okay. So this is a variation of concentration, and I need to change it into how the freezing temperature varies with distance. And once that is greater than that, I will get uh, unstable, an unstable interface. Okay. So how do I change this into uh, an equation containing the concentration gradient? Well, all I have to do is multiply m by dCl by dx, and I get this term. Okay. Because this is the variation of concentration. This is how the liquidus temperature changes with concentration. And therefore, these two terms are equivalent. Okay. So now I have information from the phase diagram in here. And this is the gradient of concentration at the interface. Everyone happy with that? OK. So I now substitute for this term using the equation we derived in the last lecture. You know, this is just a rearrangement of this equation. I'm taking this term, taking d at the bottom. And here we are. We now have the variation in concentration as a function of distance terms from the phase diagram, the diffusion coefficient, and the interface velocity. And I simply have to substitute that over here. And I've got the condition, which gives me the case where the actual temperature gradient is exactly equal to the liquidus temperature gradient. So that is the condition which determines whether I get dendritic solidification or a flat interface moving. Okay. Is that everyone happy with that? So this equation represents this blue line here, where the actual temperature gradient is equal to the liquidus temperature gradient. If the temperature gradient is smaller than this, then I will get a scenario like this, where I have dendritic solidification. So there is good reason why we get dendritic solidification even in impure systems and even when we have a positive temperature gradient in the liquid. Now, I've shown you lots of theory associated with solidification. And I stated the assumptions associated with that theory in the last lecture. Uh, we, we can deal with those assumptions. I simply don't want to go into complications. What I'm going to show you is a computer simulation of dendritic solidification, just to illustrate that when we put all this theory together, we can actually generate images which look very much like the actual dendrites that you see. And furthermore, the growth rates of those dendrites, et cetera, the velocity, comes out to be correct as well. So what we'll do is we'll start off with a few nuclei here. And then you'll see dendrites evolve. And remember, this is a computer simulation. So it's a kind of a validation of the theory that you've seen. That's great. Oops, that's easy. 
because this, this is just showing the evolution of microstructure by pure calculation. And you can see that these dendrites look so realistic. Okay? Not only that, but they capture a lot of the things that I said in the last lecture. By the way, the colors here represent the concentration fields. Okay? So here there is a large concentration, and then it tends to uh, become uniform between the dendrites, but the dendrites themselves have a different composition from the liquid. There's another feature you should see. This particular dendrite, you see, has been stifled in its growth. Yeah? So they all started from the same point, but the fact that these are growing rapidly because they happen to be, have their 100 directions roughly parallel to the direction of heat flow, these don't make it. And that's why we get this coarsening of microstructure as you go away from the mold wall. Okay? So everything has been captured. This is, these are known as the primary dendrites, the first dendrite arms to evolve. But you can see that you also have these secondary dendrites, and then there are more growing on those, and those become unstable, and so on. So you can get to finer and finer scales of structure as these dendrites evolve. Okay, now I'm going to show you real material solidifying. Okay, now this, uh, you will see the dendrites actually growing. You again see the stifling process. This happens to be a transparent material, so we can record this on film. So you can see some dendrites are growing faster than others, and this one is being killed off in the process. Okay? That's why you get the coarsening of microstructure as you go away from the mold wall. You can also see all these secondary dendrite arms developing, and there are minute branches even on those dendrite arms. Okay? Now, when the constitutionally supercooled zone is large, then we get dendritic solidification. So again, this is uh, the plot I showed you earlier, where we have the liquidus temperature gradient and the actual temperature gradient. And this is the extent of the supercooled zone. Okay. Now, if my temperature gradient is steep, then that supercooled zone is going to be narrow. Okay. When that happens, the, dendri the microstructure that devel develops is slightly different and is illustrated in this second movie here. You see, you don't have much, uh, much dendritic form there because the supercooled zone is narrow. So we call this a cellular solidification mode instead of a, a structure like this where the liquid penetrates quite deep into the mixture of solid and liquid. That is not the case here. This is a very narrow supercooled zone, and this is called cellular solidification. So you have dendritic solidification, you have cellular solidification, and then you have the interface moving in a stable way as a flat interface. This is a, a case of a, a zinc alloy, which was solidified partly and then the liquid dispensed off with. And you can see the beautiful dendritic structures for, in three dimensions here from a metallic material. Okay, so we've dealt with constitutional supercooling. Constitutional supercooling happens because there is a solute concentration variation in the liquid ahead of the interface. That leads to a corresponding freezing temperature variation. And if the actual temperature gradient has a certain slope, then you will get a supercooled zone ahead of it. We've dealt with cells and dendrites in alloys. And we're now going to look at the case where we lose equilibrium at the interface. And there are many examples where we actually stir the liquid electromagnetically during solidification to get more uniform composition variations. 
So when we make large quantities of steel, as it emerges from uh, into the mold, there is an electromagnetic stirring system. So any concentration variation ahead of the interface will tend to become homogenized simply by mixing. <clears throat> so if we mix the liquid by whatever mechanism, then the composition in the liquid will always be uniform. Okay? So we are now considering the case where this point here is no longer the equilibrium composition because we are stirring the liquid and as solidification pro proceeds the composition of the solid increases as we go down in temperature the solidus composition is followed okay gastro uh, let's say we have this much of solidification then the partition solute is evenly distributed in the liquid so this can simply be calculated by mass balance yeah, whatever solute has been rejected from the solid ends up in the liquid and is uniformly distributed in the liquid. If I allow a little bit more of solidification, then we simply raise the composition of the liquid, the average composition of the liquid. Uh, this K is simply the partition coefficient that we talked about earlier, the ratio between the composition of the solid and the composition of the liquid. Now, as I increase my fraction of solid from this point to this point, I've actually shoved that much solute in the liquid, and from mass balance, that must equal to this area here. Yeah. So just conservation of mass says that this area must be equal to that area. So if I write down the equation for that mass balance, where df is simply this change in the fraction of solid, then clearly these two areas must be equal. Okay? f is simply the fraction solidified. And so 1 minus f is the fraction of the liquid. If I now rearrange this equation, so uh, dcl is the change in the composition of the liquid, df is the change in the fraction of the solid. If I rearrange that e uh, equation simply by taking 1 minus f onto this side and this term onto this side, then I get this. And I can integrate that so that I have the composition of the liquid at any point in the solidification process. Okay. Very, very simple derivation. This gives you the composition of the liquid as a function of the fraction of solid. This is, of course, from the phase diagram, the partitioning coefficient. And this is the average composition of the solid. And you can express this equation uh, differently uh, in terms of the composition of the solid simply by using k equals cs over cl. So we have a complete description of the variation in composition as a function of the amount of solidification. And this is known as the Scheil equation. And it has this particular form here. So as solidification proceeds, the composition of the solid rises along here, here, and then rises steeply because we've got a lot, a small amount of solute-rich liquid left. So this is a prediction of the composition of the solid as a function of solidification when everything in the liquid is homogeneous because you are stirring the liquid, for example. Now, we can use this to advantage, uh, we can refine things by allowing solidification to proceed along a narrow zone. Okay, so this, this is a hot zone, this is a solid bar, uh, and we can do this by having uh, an RF coil which moves along the bar. Okay? So by doing that, you are putting excess solute in the last region of the rod to solidify. If I repeat this, then I will get even more solute ending up in the end of the bar. And I can continue doing that, forcing solute to, to go to the end of the bar in order to purify the rest of the bar. Okay? So this is, for example, the way in which you purify silicon so that you can remove impurities and then add controlled additions of things like phosphorus as 
dopants you know, to make semiconducting devices. You need it to be extremely pure because you want to add controlled additions of dopants to get the semiconduction properties. Or to make extremely pure niobium, for example, for semiconduction and so on. So if, you, if I repeat this cycle many, many times, then I get a curve like this. And you can chop this part off and use the pure component of the bar for devices, for example, semiconducting devices. So that's called zone refining. On the other hand, if I first solidify in this direction and then reverse that process, then I get something called zone leveling, where I tend to produce a bar of a homogeneous composition. Because I'm starting from this point first, then I go this way and do that many times. And I can get a homogeneous composition during that solidification process. And that's called zone leveling. Again, it's uh, described in your lecture notes. So that simple theory uh, of the Scheil equation allows you to develop technology which, with which you can create incredibly pure samples of material. So you know, you're talking about parts per billion concentration. Now, when we partition solute between the dendrites, okay, uh, you saw in that color movie here that these colors represent solute concentrations. Clearly, you know, these regions which are trapped between the dendrite arms will solidify as solute-rich material. Okay? And when you, are, when you are making huge, massive quantities of metallic alloys, you can't sort of uh, zone level or zone refine and so on. That's just too expensive and too Im impractical. So you will always end up with regions of chemical segregation regions which are richer in solute than other regions, because this is not equilibrium. You're not giving enough time for the solid and the liquid to follow the phase boundaries on the phase diagram. When you then come to process these uh, segregated alloys, that segregation will spread out depending on what processing you do. For example, if you're doing uh, rolling, then those bands of solute-rich material will spread out. And you end up with microstructures that look like this. So this, this is a very, very common microstructure in steel. The microstructure has actually developed in the solid state. But because we have variations in composition, you get a different microstructure here compared with in between those dark regions. And this is called banding. And the reason why we have these bands is because the rolling process spreads out that chemical segregation over large distances. Now, in some circumstances, this is a useful thing to have. For example, if we have a crack propagating through the system in this direction, then it will be deflected frequently. So this is, this is like a, a, a composite material. You know, we, we often create artificial composites which contain layers of different materials so that a crack has a very tortuous path to pass through the microstructure. But on occasions, this is not good. So for example, if, if um, we have uh, corrosion, this black region will have different chemical properties from the white region. Okay? And one of the courses that you're going to do in part 1b deals with materials and the environment. And it is these minute variations in structure which give you different chemical properties. So you effectively set up electrochemical cells when the material is in contact with uh, a corrosive medium. Okay? So in those circumstances, you really don't want chemical segregation. So when we make um, pipelines for oil and gas transmission, you know, those are very corrosive materials because they contain things like sulfur and so forth. And we, wish we make the steel in such a way that you do not get this banded microstructure. Okay, so all the theory that we've done so far is extremely useful in controlling the microstructure and properties on a very large scale. 
you get a pipeline, oil pipeline failure, and it's transmitting you know, oil across Siberia or Alaska, that can cause enormous pollution and huge expense. OK, one way of controlling this banding is that if we force solidification to happen at a large undercooling, then the spacing between the dendrites decreases. And this is an amazing uh, experimental plot where we are looking at the dendrite spacing versus the cooling rate involved during solidification. And it's amazing because the cooling rate varies over something like 10 orders of magnitude. Okay, so we, we, can, we can do experiments in which the cooling rate is 10 to the 8 Kelvin per second using, for example, lasers. Uh, and the dendrite arm spacing here is varying by some six orders of magnitude. And yet, you know, all of these points fall on the straight line. And that's because the theory says that the variation in dendrite arm spacing should be, uh, these are, of course, logarithmic scales, but on logarithmic scales, it should be a straight line. So supposing we want to minimize the effects of chemical segregation, then we must force solidification to occur at a lower temperature, a larger undercooling below the equilibrium temperature. When that happens, the scale of the segregation decreases. Okay? And you can even get to a point where solidification happens without any partitioning of solute. Okay? So you force the solid to inherit the composition of the liquid because solidification is happening so rapidly that solutes don't have time to diffuse out of the way of the interface. Okay? So that's partitionless solidification. So depending on how much you are willing to pay and you know, what is the scale of your material, clearly you cannot achieve 10 to the 8 Kelvin per second if you have a large lump of material. Okay? So depending on what product we are making, how much we are willing to pay for it, we can actually select the level of chemical segregation in the material. Now, in the next lecture, I, I will show you actual casting processes. So we've completed all the theory that you need for solidification. And we are going to look at casting ranging from extremely precise casting, which has three-dimensional structure in it, so a deliberately designed structure, to casting on a scale which produces about 1.3 billion tons of material per year with the very latest technology. So we've covered all the theory, and we are just going to do examples of casting processes in the next lecture. Anybody have any questions? OK, just to finish off, I've put the slide presentations on the teaching website. And these lectures are being videoed. And the videos of the first two lectures are also available on the website if you want to revise at some stage. Okay, So thank you very much.